we need to roll back the clock to the very beginnings of time, and we'll see, not the Simpsons, but we'll see the Big Bang. Astrophysicists and scientists everywhere have got a uniform viewpoint that all matter originated with this Big Bang about 14 billion years ago with an unbelievable amount of energy that was being pushed outwards from a single point. The early universe and the first few seconds after the Big Bang were, were unbelievably hot. This huge temperature, too hot even for the simplest atomic particles to exist. These finally coalesced to a point where there could be atoms and then there could be molecules of more complex compounds. And after a few hundred thousand years, the first, what we would see now is interstellar bodies would exist in the universe. And over the first billion years, these galaxies are forming and growing all the time. And now we're 14 billion years along. The background of this is not a guess. We can see back in time all the way to just three hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, there's a trace still visible that we can see with our telescopes. And this is a time when the universe was still so hot that the average temperature of all matter was above 3,000 degrees. So this is the afterglow from the Big Bang that's from 370,000 years after. So this is about 13.8 billion years ago. And in that huge background that we can see in space with the right instruments, the orange regions are still a little bit warmer and the blue areas are a little bit cooler. So it wasn't a uniform heat in the background. There were some areas that were hotter and some were cooler. And this disparities allowed for the formation of galaxies. This is the oldest known galaxy seen in way, way deep space. Because of the red shift, that means we know it's traveling very, very rapidly away from us. And this dates from about 13.1 billion years ago. This is an actual photograph of what that galaxy would have looked like 13 billion years ago. Now, our solar system formed about 5 billion years ago. And it would have been by a process that we can still see in space, where there are regions with star-forming columns of gas and dust. And it's in those areas where you get the compression of matter to form stars. Now, the Earth formed about four and a half billion years ago with matter that was orbiting around the sun, coming together, gravity getting more and more powerful as the object grew, removing any bits and pieces in our orbit. But this bombardment generated so much heat that all the lighter elements on the early Earth vaporized and went out into space. And so the early Earth only consisted of rather heavy elements like iron, and magnesium, sulfur, those sorts of things. Now, comets are attractive. We love to see comets as they go through the night sky. And a comet is actually little more than a dirty snowball. And they emit smaller compounds into space as they are vaporized by the energy of the sun. So this is Hartley's Comet from 2010. And this is spewing out various gases. And so the comet's tail, which is such an attractive feature, consists of carbon dioxide, CH4 is methane, and ammonia. So these compounds would have been coming to the early Earth, seeded by the tails of comets. This early atmosphere, as the Earth is cooling down after that initial bombardment, is now cool enough to allow the water vapor, the methane, and the ammonia to remain in the atmosphere. And the surface of the Earth would have been covered by volcanoes with a huge amount of geological instability, and it's still an enormous amount of heat coming out from the Earth's core. And these volcanoes, massive eruptions all over the Earth's surface would have been throwing out masses of gas into the atmosphere. And the sheer physical force of all of these clouds of gas coming out a lot of friction generates a, ma a massive amount of electricity in the form of lightning. Now, the circumstances of early Earth with lightning in a soupy sky is something that we can actually mimic in a laboratory on a very much smaller scale. But this is done with what's called a Miller apparatus. And the Miller apparatus heats up in a closed system of flasks, boils water, 
putting water vapor into the atmosphere here where there's already methane and ammonia and hydrogen gas and then having an electrode make sparks across mimics the action of lightning and then having those simple compounds exposed to repeated lightning you can see what happens if there's some sort of compounds that are generated and in fact indeed this will generate organic compounds. So these have been taken out and they can be sampled for chemical analysis. So what kind of organic compounds are synthesized by this sort of apparatus, the Miller apparatus? And this is the experiment that goes back to 1952. Lo and behold, it turns out that spontaneously within the Miller apparatus you get amino acids. So these different ones that we know are the essential parts of proteins. And they also will generate nucleotides. The GACTA of Gattaca of DNA and the guac of RNA. So those building blocks can all be synthesized spontaneously in a Miller apparatus. Now more recently, Miller's experiments were revisited, where in fact the actual compounds that were generated in his original experiments could be viewed in far greater detail because our chemical sensitivities are far higher than they were in the early 1950s. And it turns out that the Miller experiment, and this can be replicated over and over again, will generate all 22 of the amino acids. So if we imagine the whole Earth's surface is one massive Miller apparatus with vast amounts of lightning, and this is going on for millions and millions of years over the entire atmosphere of the Earth, it's not hard to see how we would get, eventually, the primordial soup. Vast, vast quantities of amino acids and nucleotides.